Now we talked about those three basic terms, medium, iconography, and style. And we've gone into style a great deal. But now I want to give you some more terms. And the two other major terms, one is composition and the other is patron. Now, composition is the unified organization of the visual elements. Or you've got all these visual elements, you know, you could, what, if you had a canvas that you had, you know, a dot of red here and a, a, a texture over here and a line down the middle, that may or may not be a work of art. with some exceptions in some kind of theories, but generally we say that the visual elements have to be unified in some way. They have to be organized. They have to be arranged. So what's the difference between style, well, um, the distinctive manner in which the visual elements are used, and composition? Well, you could almost say that composition is an element of style because it's very important in the manner in which the artist uh, or uh, the artists of a particular time or place would use these visual elements. So when you're taking an exam and you're trying to decide does that definition mean composition or does it mean style, look for words like unified, organized, arranged, and that will tell you you're taking all the visual elements and you're putting them together. You're creating a composition. And sometimes artists use that name, composition, as the title of their artwork, uh, particularly, in uh, particularly in 20th century and contemporary art, as we go into the 21st century. Uh, sometimes artists will just say, oh, this is composition number one, two, three, four. <laughs> uh, and particularly with works of art that have no subject matter from the visible world, uh, works that are non-objective or non-representational. But all works of art have an arrangement of the visual elements, a composition. Now, generally we think that composition should be balanced in some way. And there's two different types of balance. One is symmetry, and the other is asymmetry. Another way of organizing uh, is to repeat different elements. You would have a repeated line, a repeated shape, a repeated color, for example. And when you repeat something, we say that it sets up a rhythm, just like in music. Um, in music, you might have a beat, and you are repeating different elements. You might have a, a strong beat, and then two quick ones, and then that strong one again, and then two quick ones. Very simple rhythm. Uh, you can do this visually as well. Okay, let's talk about symmetry. Now, one way you can think of symmetry is you can think of a balance, say a fulcrum. And in this case, in the middle you have something, uh, let's call it a 10 pound weight. Uh, on either side, you have two five pound weights. And that balances very symmetrically. So let's look at an example. This is a 15th century Italian uh, Renaissance painting and it's arranged with perfect symmetry. Uh, as you can see in the center you have this unified shape of the Madonna and child or the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. And then on one side you have two standing saints, on the other side you have two standing saints. 
Even the architectural setting is absolutely symmetrical. Uh, you have this uh, archway uh, under which uh, the Virgin sits in front of a little niche with a shell motif in the background. And there is uh, another arch on the other side. And then if you look uh, over the architecture, you see uh, uh, trees. But if you were to draw a line right straight down the middle, it would be extremely similar on both sides. As we say, we have the one main shape of the Virgin and Child together, and then the two saints on either side. Now, you'll notice what I'm saying, symmetrical. I'm not saying it has to be exactly symmetrical. It doesn't have to be the same saint in the same pose, uh, identical. That would be a very boring composition and probably in most cases wouldn't make any sense. Why would you have St. Lucy twice, for example? Uh, so, you know, we're talking here um, about something relatively symmetrical. The other type of balance we talked about was asymmetry. So I picked a 16th century Venetian painting by Titian uh, to show you asymmetry. And in this case, very similar subject, in this case you have the Virgin and Child, you have some saints, uh, and you also have uh, the people, uh, the family of the people who uh, donated this work of art or who uh, had the work of art commissioned. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in this case, Mary is not in the center. She's off to one side. And your eye still goes to her though, doesn't it? Okay, let's think about our fulcrum again. If you have, as we said, say a five pound weight on one side, or two five pound weights on one side and two five pound weights on the other side, that's symmetrical. But what if you have two five pound weights and a three pound weight, a two pound weight, and a five pound weight? Wait, wait, there's still 10 pounds on either side. They still balance, but they're different. So that's something like what we see here. We see the main subject, the baby Jesus with his mother, on one side. And our, if you look at this, if you think of her as sort of the apex of a triangle, you know, so the top point, uh, you can see there's this diagonal with the other saint. This is Saint Peter, who's uh, got the book and he's looking down. And uh, that uh, implied diagonal goes down uh, to the donor, uh, uh, Jacopo Pissarro, who is kneeling there. And then we come across the base and then uh, we could, in a sense, come up through uh, Saint Francis of Assisi, who is uh, uh, looking at uh, the Christ child. And that forms a kind of implied right angle triangle. So you've got some geometric unity there. Um, also, you may notice that the Virgin Mary wears this white veil, which seems to be about the lightest uh, color in the entire work. And she's also wearing a red garment. We do see a red flag, but uh, the flag is one big shape. And the human figure is a much more intricate shape. You've got different shapes, you've got different colors, um, and human beings are, you could say, hardwired, as it were, to look at human beings. Um, so our eyes drawn to that figure of Mary, which is much more complex, has um, bright colors, light colors, and uh, complex shapes. Also, if you look at the little cloud that's right above her head, you can see uh, it sort of points to her in a sense. So you almost have uh, the diagonal pointing to her and the uh, cloud pointing to her. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, you have this idea of the gaze where Mary looks down uh, and the Christ child is looking down at uh, the saint, St. Saint Francis of Assisi, who is standing right next to him. Uh, and the chi child is, is quite lively, you might notice. I, um, okay, so it's still balanced. For example, you have that big red flag across from Mary. Um, and that certainly, you know, it balances it out, but it's not symmetrical. You know, we still want to look at the uh, uh, more interesting shapes and forms of the Virgin and the child. Uh, and then, of course, that's only about halfway up the picture. Uh, on the other side, sort of uh, 
you know, going to the left where she's on the right, or our right, uh, we have this cloud with these uh, angels holding the cross up above. So, you know, it all, because this is a little further over on the left, you know, the, the uh, cloud extends over all the way to the edge there. Uh, that also helps to provide some balance. Okay, so there's asymmetrical balance or asymmetry. Now, I mentioned the people who commission the painting. There's different ways that artists make a living. Um, and in many times, um, most of the art was commissioned. In other words, someone ordered the painting or sculpture from the artist. And often there'd be a contract, it'd say, um, you know, what the subject matter was supposed to be, what the size of it, what materials were supposed to be used, especially if expensive materials would be used, like gold or ultramarine blue. And there would be a, um, oftentimes you might have um, a schedule, you know, uh, when you're supposed to get so far along and you'd be paid so much, you know, uh, and when it would be due. Um, so, much art is commissioned or ordered from the artist. Other times, of course, in certain periods, and uh, this is probably much more frequent today, uh, the artist paints a painting and hopes that someone will buy it. Um, in religious, so the person who commissions the work of art is called a patron. And you've heard that, the patron of the arts. Uh, it can also be someone who supports the artist. For example, um, the Duke of Milan uh, invited Leonardo da Vinci to come and live with him and uh, stay in you know, his palace and work for him. And he, he, he gave the artist uh, uh, support. Um, he gave him probably a stipend. He uh, gave him room and board, uh, you know, uh, and uh, presumably when he painted a painting for him, uh, paid him for that as well. Uh, the Duke of Burgundy paid an annual salary to Jan van Eyck. Uh, so he was Jan van Eyck's patron. So there's different ways to be a patron, but essentially the person who's uh, supporting the artist or paying for the work of art is the patron. And it can be an individual, it can also be an institution. Um, you could have uh, an organization um, that pays for a work of art. We often tell today people who are patrons of the arts, people who donate money to support, say, the symphony or something like that. Uh, so there's a number of ways you can be a patron. And when we're studying uh, the patron and the purpose of the art and uh, all of the things related to this, we talk about patronage studies. Now, we have another term that we sometimes apply to the patron. In religious art, we often call the patron the donor. And this comes out of the same root as donation. So the idea is you're creating the work of art and you're giving it to the church, you're donating it to the church. As a matter of fact, uh, very frequently the donor and his family and their descendants uh, still technically own the painting which is displayed on their family altar in the church or the chapel. Um, but when we see uh, the, uh, the donors as we call them, uh, the uh, people who paid for the painting and uh, maybe their family represented here. Uh, and they very frequently are shown in religious paintings uh, kneeling uh, to the saints or to the virgin and child or to Christ or you know, whatever they're showing. Um, but in, in Christian art, they often are shown kneeling there. And we call those donor portraits. You know, if, if it looks like the donor, uh, it's a portrait of him. And so here you see uh, Jacopo Passaro, Signor Passaro, uh, kneeling, and then the other members of his family, the male members, we don't in this case see female members, although uh, they are frequently represented in art, um, 
And this painting actually is called the Pissarro Madonna um, after the patron because there are so many uh, paintings of the Virgin and Child by this artist, Titian. You couldn't just say uh, the Madonna and Child. Uh, you have to distinguish them in some way. And in this case, we usually do it with the name of the patron. Okay, I want to give you some other stylistic terms. And these are very general. And sometimes you could think about them in relation to each other. Is this work more abstract than that work, for example? Um, but we talk about naturalistic art or naturalism when the art looks like the material world. You know, it's trying to create the illusion that it's, it's real. No, that's that the physically present. Um, sometimes that can be naturalism where they're showing a lot of details, like the Jan van Eyck's um, uh, image of Mary that you saw earlier when I was talking about texture. Or sometimes it can be um, a world that's maybe a little ugly, you know, or somebody who's not a beautiful person. <laughs> Uh, or something like that, but it's supposed to look like the natural world. Now, we also, and I'm sure you've heard this word too, we also use the word realism or realistic. And some people make um, fine distinctions between naturalism and realism. I'm not going to do that. And for our more general term, I'm using naturalism or naturalistic. When we get to the 19th century, you'll find that there is an art movement called realism. And so, although it may slip out from time to time to use naturalism and realism interchangeably, uh, I'm going to try to reserve that for uh, the 19th century art movement. The second term is idealism or idealistic art. And this is also art that refers to an illusion of the material world. But in this case, it's perfected. Now, what do we mean by perfected? It's this perfect world. Well, don't different people have different ideas of perfection? Yes. And so usually when we're talking about idealistic art, we're talking about art that is in some way based on a classical ideal, an ideal uh, based on um, symmetry, on uh, mathematical ratios or proportions. So for example, the human being uh, may have certain proportions or certain mathematical ra ratios that actually come to us from Greek art. Uh, eight heads tall or nine heads tall are usually considered to be the ideal proportions for a human being. Now you'll notice we don't use a uh, specific, we don't say you know so many feet or uh, so many meters or something like that um, because we have different size artwork. So it's a proportion, a ratio. And certain times and certain places are more likely to have idealistic art. Uh, for example, during the Renaissance or the neoclassical period. And yes, you could argue about where is this fine line. You, know, you might look at a work of art and say, well, this is naturalistic because it's got lots of details, but they have idealized the female figure. Yeah, you could do that. You, know, you can find distinctions. Um, the third of these broad stylistic terms is abstraction, or abstract being the adjective, abstract art. Now, some people will use the term abstraction and mean what I use non-representational for. You know, it has no reference. It doesn't copy anything in the visible world. But that's a very, very, very narrow of ab definition of abstraction. Um, in that case, I'd say you're talking about what total abstraction, non-objectivity, or non-representational art. I'm using abstract in a larger sense. When something is not trying to create the illusion of the visible world or does not create the illusion of the visible world so you know perfectly if you might say. Um, and that may be that something in it is exaggerated or a distorted 
or stylized or simplified uh, for sometimes expressive reasons and sometimes aesthetic reasons. Um, you know, the artist is not interested in, or in some cases, um, you know, has not developed, I don't want to say the skill, but uh, there are certain periods which are more abstract, and this is the way they create art. Uh, and then there are other artists, say, in the early 20th century, who choose uh, to create abstract art. Um, because they feel that the uh, illusionistic art has just been done, 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 and they would like to do something different. Now, to give you an idea of this, I want to show you some examples. Here's an example of naturalism. And something I'm doing here is my examples are all out of Roman and Greek art, what we call classical art. Um, the Greek styles uh, often uh, fit very nicely into these categories. So here we're looking um, at a uh, bust of, presumably it's a philosopher, it's sometimes called the pseudo-Seneca, uh, because that's what they thought it was, but now they don't think it's necessarily Seneca, but in an old man. And, you know, he's got wrinkles and, 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 and uh, you know, he's, he's sagging in places and he really needs to comb his hair. But if you saw this guy on the street, having seen this, but you might, you might recognize him. I mean, he is extremely naturalistic. Then we have a picture of a philosopher, once again. Um, in this case, they possibly have idealized the body a bit, but the head, once again, looks like a, you know, I, I, say, I want to say it looks like a portrait. It may not be a portrait. It may be, a, you know, say, imaginary portrait, but it looks like it could be a real person. Uh, you know, it's not the most perfect person, and yet it clearly looks very naturalistic. Here are some examples of idealism. You see uh, a work of art that you've probably uh, seen pictures of before, uh, the discus thrower, which is a Roman copy after a lost Greek statue uh, from the 5th century BCE uh, by the artist Myron. And, you know, the, the uh, the proportions are these eight heads tall, the uh, athletic ideal of the fifth century. Uh, you know, absolutely perfect proportions, perfect musculature. Uh, and you may notice that the face just doesn't seem to have a lot of emotion in it. It's very smoothed over. Um, if you were thinking about how a real discus thrower might look, probably wouldn't look like that. Um, discus is very heavy, and so a lot of times people who specialize in discus throwing would have um, maybe a overdeveloped upper body strength compared to their lower body. So there might be a little out of proportion there. And generally when you're throwing the discus, this is hard work, so you probably would be screwing up your face. You'd probably be showing the strain of this rather than looking perfectly emotionless, as it were. So this is not how an actual discus thrower, you know, Joe the discus thrower, <laughs> uh, might have looked like. Um, it is, or maybe I should say Demetrius the discus thrower. Um, you know, it's an ideal figure. It's perfected um, beyond which the, you know, individual mortal probably would not uh, uh, look like this. But we recognize it very clearly. It's certainly an illusionistic figure. And then I have two heads here, uh, one in profile, uh, one a three-quarter view, and these are both idealized youths. Uh, as you can see, they have this uh, straight nose and the rounded jaw uh, and you know, no wrinkles. Uh, the face is in perfect proportion. You know, they don't have a too wide or too tiny mouth or something like that. You know, everything is in perfect proportion, perfect ratios. So there's another example of idealism. Um, you know, we don't look at this and say, oh yeah, I think that's a portrait of so-and-so who might have their little quirks. Okay, abstraction. Now, these are works from the 6th century BCE. They're earlier than the other works that you saw. And at this point, uh, there's still a lot of stylization of the human figure. Um, earlier, they had figures, we actually called them the geometric fig uh, period, uh, where, uh, for example, the torso might look like a triangle. 
Uh, and so they're becoming more illusionistic, more natural or ideal, um, but they're still very, very stylized and certain things are exaggerated or distorted. So let's look at the standing figure first. Um, you can see there's parts that are smoothed over and uh, the way the rib, the musculature of the rib cage is shown, the rib cage is simply an incised curving line and the mus musculature is indicated by another straight line going down the center. Um, not quite the way it would be. Uh, you've also got these um, incised lines at the knees. There's a lot of emphasis there. Uh, the forms are smoothed over. You have a general shape, uh, but perhaps not uh, specific things that would look very naturalistic. And of course, once again, the face is, um, yes, the nose is broken. That's, that's condition. That's not how the artist created it. Um, but uh, it's simplified, stylized. Uh, even the hair, as you can see, uh, you know, forms a pattern. Uh, rather than looking like you know, actual hair might. And look at the way the figure's standing. The figure is standing with the weight on both legs, as it were. You know, it looks very, very rigid. A, a real person would probably have the weight on one leg or the other. You know, they might be uh, shifting uh, uh, their weight. Uh, so there'd be a little twist to the body. But, you know, this is somewhat abstract. We recognize it as a young man, a youth. In fact, uh, they call these figures koros figures, which is uh, Greek for a youth or a young man. And then let's look at the face that we have here, this, this uh, head that we have here. Uh, once again, there's some damage. We have to ignore that. Uh, but there's an exaggeration of these curving forms, like the eyes are very, very large. Uh, and of course, the, the upper part of the eye is, is uh, uh, extremely curved, almost a half circle. And then the arc of the uh, eyebrows above it. And of course, this relates, that's sort of the opposite of the, the rounded chin line. Um, and a little smile there. And you can see uh, the ears sort of stick out on either side. They're not really laid back against the head, but they form other uh, you know, curving forms, as do the bangs. Uh, you have these little U-shapes of the hair at the, at the top of the brow. And then the hair that hangs down, um, it's, it's almost a kind of zigzag pattern. So once again, it's pattern stylized, some exaggeration, some simplification. So both of these are in some ways distorted compared to a ordinary person. Uh, distorted doesn't have to mean, you know, completely askew. It can be. Um, it, you know, it can refer to a simplification or an exaggeration of forms. Now, I use the word illusionism a couple of times. Sometimes you, you know, you're not quite sure. Is that naturalistic or is it idealistic? It's, we could argue both ways, somewhere in the middle. And so you just say, I, I need a word that encompasses both. And that word would be illusionism. Art that creates the illusion that the painted or the carved, you know, whatever the medium is, or the drawn, uh, world is real. The world that is created in that artwork looks real in some way. And so the art is trying to create the illusion that the visible, that the artistic world uh, is, is real. And that would include both examples of naturalism and idealism. Okay. You decide. What do you think this is? Naturalism? Idealism? Abstraction. You probably said abstraction, correct? Yeah, this actually is a early uh, 20th century sculpture by Brancusi. And it shows you, uh, it's Mademoiselle Pogenet. Uh, so, you know, it's actually given a title as though it were a portrait, though it's certainly not a likeness. Uh, it gives you this feeling of gracefulness, 
uh, very, very stylized uh, features, you know, sort of the idea of the brow coming down and meeting and becoming part of the nose and the whole head as a kind of ovoid. Uh, and then you have this fan-like shape that repeats the curving forms uh, down the back. So obviously, I think we would say that this, this is not illusionistic, it is uh, abstract. Which is it? Well, this is a portrait, a self-portrait by Rembrandt. And you'll notice that he doesn't look like you know, an idealized figure uh, with the you know, perfect proportions and the youthful face with no wrinkles. I mean, he's showing himself pretty much probably as he was. Um, now he's on bulbous nose. The, he's probably in his 50s here. He's getting up in years and he's uh, got some sags and wrinkles. And, you know, it's a naturalistic view of the artist. Which is it? Well, I've got one left, right? And let's just show you a close-up of the face as well. Yeah, this one is idealized. Uh, this is a uh, Madonna uh, and child with the uh, young uh, John the Baptist, and it's by the artist Raphael. And Raphael is known for his graceful idealism. So the proportions of this figure are absolutely perfect. You can see this ovoid face uh, and the features are all in balance, uh, you know, smooth skin. Uh, this beautiful Madonna, uh, you'll notice that it's a very symmetrical picture. And uh, symmetry often goes with idealism. Not 100% either way, but uh, uh, very frequently you will see that. OK. This one's a little harder. Would you call it naturalistic, idealistic, abstract? Yeah, that one you could argue about, couldn't you? Probably not idealistic, but is it naturalism? Certainly, we you know we see, for example, the fruit you know looking very real, and yet there are elements of abstraction in the still life by Cezanne, a late 19th century artist who lived into the early 20th century. He died in 1906, um, and so let's point out some of the abstract elements about this. Uh, you have to, you have these vertical bottles, a bottle and a, some kind of a vase or vessel of some kind. And you'll notice that the bottle and vessel are not perfectly symmetrical. One side, the right side, as we're looking at it, our right, um, pulls or pushes off uh, toward the right. And so it's drawing your eye in that direction. With the bottle, there's some angular shapes there. And with the glass uh, vase, um, you know, as one side is just going to be pulled out. It's almost as though, as you stare at something, there's emphasis given to it. And says, I was supposed to have often you know, looked and looked and looked at his motif, as they called it, whether it was a still life or a landscape, uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and that actually helps the composition, because as you'll notice, uh, the draperies go completely over to the left side, and then there's this uh, sort of blank space, if you will, you know, a colored background, uh, on the right. So that pulls these vessels, it pulls your eye, uh, and helps to balance out that uh, drapery. So it's not you know, absolutely symmetrical, it's a little asymmetrical. Uh, then if you look at the drapery folds, and you'll notice uh, that they seem to form a, a little bit of stylization of the pattern. Um, there's these kind of rounded shapes in them, and it's, it's somewhat simplified. So, you know, we, as I said, we could sit here and talk about it. I think this, this is has elements of abstraction in it, let's say that. Um, it's one of the works of arts that's pointing the way toward greater abstraction, of course.